Um, welcome, everybody. Um, I want to welcome you to this forum. Um, this is uh, a, a unique opportunity, and both for NDN and for all of you, um, to have a to hear from and have a real conversation with Phil with Phil Angelitas, who's the chairman of the Financial Crisis uh, Inquiry Commission. Let me say, um, from the point of view of an economist, he has simply the best job in the world. Um, we have this unique crisis, unique in modern economic history, and he has the job of figuring out how it came to be and what we can do about it. Um, and not just as an academic exercise, um, but in order to guide the Congress um, and the administration on what to do about it. Um, this is a particular, a particularly propitious economic moment um, to be examining this, not only because um, the crisis is still so fresh and indeed continues to unfold in new phases of it today, um, but also because we're in the midst of the season in which government tries to figure out how to address both the results of that crisis in terms of unemployment and growth, as well as the causes of, those, of that crisis in terms of um, um, the financial system. Um, I was in Europe last week and to discuss actually other financial issues. And I was in Brussels in conversations with uh, members of the European Council. And um, let me say it's become another one of those periods in which the United States is to blame for everything that's going wrong in the world. And the financial crisis is, of course, the source of that. Um, when we see a company like Toyota, probably the strongest automobile company in the world, scrambling to fix a problem um, because they know it could have real lasting damage to their brand. We ought to be thinking about the United States and financial reform. The United States has a brand. It has a great brand uh, around the world, an economic and political brand, which has changed the course of policy around the world and the lives of billions of people, quite literally. Well, that brand um, is in serious danger of being debased. Um, and it's like Toyota. The problem is not simply a PR problem. It's a real problem. Um, we found out important things about the markets in this crisis. Uh, we found out most prominently um, that at this particular point in time, our capital markets cannot properly price the risk of asset-based securities and their derivatives. Um, as an economist, that means efficient market theory doesn't work right now, doesn't hold, which has enormous implications. Um, if markets can't price the risk of uh, trillions of dollars in securities, then either we have to figure out a way to help markets price that risk, or we have to insulate first the financial system. We, we have to reduce the potential cost of that incapacity for the financial system. And then we have to insulate the rest of the economy from the effects when that dysfunction in the market um, uh, occurs on a large enough scale to affect the rest of the economy. This is very serious business, folks. Um, and if there's any doubt, um, I had um, uh, my trusty assistant, who is in the second row, um, compute, put, pulled together all the costs so far of the financial crisis just to the government, not the cost to the economy, not the cost to investors and to homeowners, and the cost to, we have lost 7.3 million jobs in the course of this, of this particular cycle. Not, the cost, not all those costs, just the cost to the government. And they are running now at between 2 and $3 trillion 
that would have been enough to pay for health care for a generation without raising any new money. That's the dimensions of the cost of the dysfunctions of these institutions at the heart of the economy which is at the core of the world's economy. And that's why they're blaming us in Europe. And that's why we have a brand problem. And we're going to hear now um, from the man in charge of figuring out um, what caused that damage to that brand and what we can do about it. Um, I have been a great admirer of his even before he got the job that I think is the greatest job in America today. Uh, he was a great treasurer uh, of the state of California, went to a great school, that <laughs> my alma mater too. Um, but more important, he was a force for genuine and serious reform, um, including in corporate practices and financial practices, in pension investment. Um, He's a man which um, everyone should admire and is the man at the right place at the right time for all of us right now. Um, so I give you Phil. Thank you. Thanks, Phil. So first of all, um, it's an honor to be here, to be uh, part of this tradition of engaging our fellow citizens in the issues of the day. And I want to uh, thank NDN for asking me to come here today and thank you for taking the time to have a dialogue during this lunch hour. Uh, I do want to talk today about why I'm here in Washington uh, as chairman of the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission. And I want to talk to you a little bit about our mission and purpose, about how we intend to go about our work, and uh, what over the course of the next 11 months uh, we hope to achieve for our country. I think I'll try to talk for 10 or 15 minutes and then sit down and field all your questions. So first of all, let me talk a little bit about the commission just by way of background. I assume many of you in this room know about our genesis and our composition, but we were created as part of the Mortgage Fraud Recovery Act in May of 2009, uh, passed by Congress, signed by the President of the United States. We have 10 members of our commission, a bipartisan commission, uh, six Democratic appointees, four Republican appointees. Um, we have been operating very much as a bipartisan commission with an important nonpartisan national mission. Uh, Bill Thomas, my fellow Californian from Bakersfield, 28-year member of Congress, uh, six years as head of the Ways and Means Committee, is the vice chair of the commission. And we have been working hand in hand since we were appointed to build the team and to chart the course for our inquiry. Um, we spent a lot of time together. I joked uh, recently that uh, I've worked harder on my relationship with Bill Thomas than I had ever worked on my relationship with my wife, to which Mr. Thomas responded, and I'm sure with far fewer rewards. Um, but in this town that is often rent apart on partisan uh, bases, uh, we have found enormous common ground because, at least at the start of our inquiry, we all recognize the deep uh, and lasting implications of what has transpired in our financial markets and our economy and uh, the extent to which this is vital to the national interest, not just the interest of any one party. Uh, if you look essentially at our mission, what we have been charged with doing is examining the causes of the financial and economic crisis that has gripped this country and continues to do so today, uh, to write an unbiased historical accounting of what brought our financial system to its knees. Uh, we are charged with providing a report to the Congress and the President in December of this year, a short time frame, lots to do. Um, and in the course of our inquiry, we've been asked to look at the systemic collapse. What were the driving forces? The uh, the major events and practices from global savings imbalances to monetary policy to reckless financial practices in the marketplace to fraud that permeated the subprime mortgage industry. What were the primary and driving causes to this substantial financial collapse from which we have not recovered? The second, you know, kind of very specific part of our mandate is to look at the major financial institutions that collapsed or would have collapsed, but for extraordinary government assistance. AIG, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, Bear Stearns, Lehman, Citigroup, 
uh, Morgan Stanley and, yes, institutions like Goldman Sachs. I don't know to what extent folks had a chance to watch our first hearing, but clearly there were a whole set of institutions here who got extraordinary government assistance. And we're not just talking about TARP assistance. We're talking about access to the Fed window, FDIC guarantees on loans. Uh, we're talking about a uh, ban on short selling. We're talking about substantial government assistance that continues today. I'm going to stop the water here. You guys will allow me. Now, our commission is part of a long tradition in this country of a nonpartisan look, a step away from politics at issues of major consequence to our nation. The Warren Commission, even though I would hope that uh, our findings will not be plagued by the same kind of decades of controversy. The Kerner Commission in the 1960s that looked at race relations in this country and the growing divide. And in the financial world itself, there's been a series of important inquiries over time which have looked at the collapse of our financial systems. It goes back as far as the aldridge Veland Commission in 1907 that ended up leading to the reforms that led to the Federal Reserve in 1913. And of course, the inquiry that gets a lot of attention in today's popular press is the PCORA Commission, 1933-1934, uh, undertaken by a Sicilian. And those of us of Greek descent will claim Sicily as part of Magna Graecia. Um, Ferdinand Pecora was not the first, he was not the second, he was not the third. He was the fourth general counsel of the Senate Banking Committee that undertook hearings on the market manipulations of the 1920s. A fascinating side story, though, by the way, one day to look into. Why is it that here we are seven day, decades later, and the person who gets all the fame from those hearings was the staff member of the Senate Banking Committee? I always wondered, where was that chairman? Where were those members? By design, sleeping late, having early lunches. That's a side story. But what the PCORA hearings did is they stripped back the veil and exposed for America a set of practices that occurred on Wall Street that destroyed our financial markets, practices of which the American people were barely, scarcely not aware of. And the hearings were relatively simple because what Ferdinand Pecor and his team did is they brought in the leaders of Wall Street from J.P. Morgan to National City Bank to Chase Manhattan. The names are familiar. And each and every day they peeled back the veil on the practices that had un unhinged our financial markets. And coming out of the Pecor hearings, there were very substantial reforms, but not just so much from the hearings, but certainly they added momentum and to the debate and dialogue for reform. The SEC was formed, uh, the 1940 Investment Act, fundamental changes that in the end were part of the fabric of a steady state period of broadly shared prosperity and financial market stability that lasted for decades in this country. So we do take inspiration from the past and not just from the financial arena. Probably the most recent example of a successful bipartisan commission to which we look to for inspiration is the 9-11 Commission. Five members of each party, again a step away from politics, that looked at a cataclysm that hit this country and examined how we were left so vulnerable, how we were so unprepared when the attack came. And of course all of us remember from those hearings the warnings of the FBI across the country of foreign nationals learning to fly, not take off or to land commercial airliners. We all remember the August 6 memo to the President warning about Al-Qaeda's intention to strike in this country, including destroying buildings in New York and the hijacking of planes. They undertook a very thorough inquiry, and in the end, their work added to our knowledge about how we can best secure our country. So we look to the past for inspiration. And as we do, we think a lot about how we're going to conduct this inquiry. So let me talk about this for a few minutes. First of all, we're fully underway. We've built an exceptional, talented team, people with investigatory skills, financial skills, public policy skills. I've been struck by the number of people from around this country who had very successful careers who wanted to give up time to be part of this inquiry because of its import for the country. Um, 
We have begun our public hearings, which in many ways, as my vice chairman has said, are the tip of the iceberg. They're the one-eighth of the iceberg you see as all the investigatory and research work is going on. We began in January, and we will continue through Labor Day. We will do a series of hearings on critical issues like subprime lending, on securitization, on the GSEs, on shadow banking, on the excess risk and speculation that affected our financial markets. And we're going to try to do these in a way that they're not just an academic's delight. They'll have academic and substantive integrity. But what we intend to do is bore in deep and look at specific institutions, specific leaders, the actions of real people, real institutions, because this was not merely a perfect storm. If it was a perfect storm, it is likely to have been a man-made perfect storm. And so we want, through our hearings and through our work, to try to tell this story in a way that's real and palpable, where people can make real judgments about accountability and responsibility. We're mindful of the task we've been given, so we're marching to a drummer of integrity and thoroughness. When we started out, uh, people asked, when are you going to start with the hearings? It's more important we do this well than we do it fast, even though we do have a short time frame. Some people said when we were appointed, well, gee, by the time you guys get going, the financial crisis will just be a memory, and financial reform legislation will have sailed through the House and the Senate. As it turns out, Sadly for this country, the financial crisis is still very real for tens of millions of Americans. And as we stand here today, about to begin across this country a set of hearings about our work and our full investigation, we find that Congress is just beginning to grapple in a real way with financial reform legislation. And the administration itself has added new tax and new provisions to their own proposals. So we think our timing's right for the country, and it's an examination that's warranted. As we do our work, here are some basic principles. The first is to conduct our work on the basis of, basis of facts and evidence, not opinion. All of us who have been appointed to this commission come with preconceptions. It's hard at age 56, having been fully engaged in public life, not to come to this with some views. But we've been given an important job by the people of, Cal of, of America. And so we intend to take our job seriously and do it with thoroughness and examine the facts afresh. I'll just give you one example. There's an ideological debate raging about whether Fannie and Freddie drove this crisis or whether they clearly made deep mistakes but were not really the driving forces in this crisis. Uh, there's a debate about whether the Community Reinvestment Act pushed lending institutions to go beyond what was prudent in lending. But I believe that many issues like this can be examined on the facts. And take, for example, subprime lending. The numbers are there. We can see who led the charge in subprime lending. Was it the non-depository, non-regulated financial institutions across this country? Or was it the CRA-regulated banks? Was it the folks on Wall Street who were creating private label mortgage securities? Or was it Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac? And the fact is that much of what we will look at can lend itself to good analysis. Secondly, we want to be thorough, accurate, and professional. The 9-11 Commission conducted 1,200 interviews, reviewed 2.5 million pages of documents, held 12 hearings. We intend to be as thorough. We need to do this without posturing, without bombast. Look, we've got the subpoena power. People are always asking, are you going to use it? The fact that you got it means you don't need to use it very often because it doesn't take a rocket scientist to know that the minute we issue it, we will get what we need. We have been asking for information voluntarily on tight time deadlines. We uh, ask people to clearly indicate whether or not they intend to comply within a few days. If they don't, we'll issue subpoenas. We then ask for production of documents. If they don't provide them, we'll issue subpoenas. Um, we have the right of criminal referral to the Justice Department, so if we find wrongdoing, we will refer it. But the fact is that we have a broader mandate than just trying to find 30 perps. If that's all we do, line a few people up against the wall for illegal acts, we will have underserved our mission. Because as we look at what happened over the last two decades, by virtue of what happened on Wall Street and what did not happen in the halls of the regulators, is the door was open wide to 
to a variety of behaviors, misjudgment, avarice, hubris, and yes, corruption. But I want to emphasize that much of what happened was not illegal. In fact, it was permitted and exalted. And in many respects, some of the worst uh, and most egregious actions that polluted our financial marketplace, our brand, were acts that were applauded throughout our society. Remember, it was the early part of the last decade, the 2000s, where Enron was uh, named the most admired company in the country, where their CFO became CFO of the year. So we're going to pursue trails of evidence, but we are going to, in the end, try to look at the big forces, the cultural changes, the legal changes that sent America's financial system off the cliff. Uh, we're not out to embarrass any one person, but in fact, if we unveil embarrassing facts, so be it. And I do hope in the course of this inquiry that we will provide a forum for people to confront what has occurred and who had responsibility and who's willing to take accountability. Finally, in the course of our work, we want to do our work in a way that's clear, open, and understandable. There's a lot of jargon on Wall Street, CDOs, CDO squares, RMBS, CMBS, CDS. Uh, I often think that Wall Street likes to make things complicated. Therefore, it's beyond the reach of understanding of many people, including policymakers. Uh, but the fact is that we're not going to dumb down our work. We want to make it clear. We want to make it simple. We want people to see that when we're talking about uh, credit default swaps or we're talking about mortgage securities, we want to chart out for everyone how these work, how decisions were made. When I told you earlier that we were going to look at specific institutions and practices, we envision in our public hearings, in our investigation, selecting case studies and looking at how everything worked from the ground level, the mortgage broker and the appraiser uh, originating that loan, all the way up to what was happening in the audit committee, the risk committee, the board of directors, yes, and all the way up to the people making $100 million plus a year who said they had no idea what was going on. So we want this to be thorough and understandable. And again, looking to models, the 9-11 Commission was able to produce a book that sold a million and a half copies. We hope we can do as well. We hope we can produce a report that's widely distributable, understandable. But I think we also, as the Vice Chairman has pointed out many times, have an advantage on 9-11. First of all, technology has advanced even in the last seven or eight years in terms of our ability to provide information over the Internet. Not everything will have to be in our book. If we do an examination of a institution and you want to dive deep into that, there's no reason you can't go in and find all the documents that we found and all the reports we did. And I might add that unlike 9-11, we will not be constrained by the same national security secrecy provisions that may have inhibited their ability to fully communicate with the American people. We hope to tell, in the end, the big story of what happened. But clearly, we intend to populate this story with real practices, real decisions by real people. So let me conclude with this before we go to questions. What do we hope to achieve? Well, what's happened here, as you mentioned, is of enormous consequence to our country. People have talked about this crisis as if it was, when in fact it still is. I mean, of course, the deep irony of our work today is it appears that the only people spared ongoing struggle in this country have been the titans of Wall Street, where who are at the center of the storm, who receive trillions of dollars in government assistance and are now making record profits. But sadly for the rest of the country, the financial crisis is real. 26 million people out of work, can't find full-time work, or have stopped looking for work. Two million homes lost to foreclosure in the last three years, and in the third quarter of last year, another 750,000 homes went into the foreclosure process. $12 trillion of wealth lost. So there is a hunger in this country to know what the heck happened. There's a hunger for accountability. There's a hunger to ensure that those who acted irresponsibly are held responsible. Um, our job in the end is not to shed light, heat, but to shed light, to try to convert some of the anger that the American people feel, and rightly so, into a deeper understanding of what occurred so that um, we do not repeat um, what happened in history. 
Um, as we stand here today, I want to tell you I am struck by the extent to which the trust in our financial system has been shaken. So many people in this country who abided by the rules now find themselves out of work. Their home values decimated, their life savings wiped away. Um, and I might add, you and I know that there are many innocent victims of what has happened here, people who had built up their equity relentlessly, who didn't participate in the kind of speculative fever that occurred in this country, who now find their economic security and prospects deeply damaged. In the wake of the uh, market crash of 1929, uh, there was a whole generation of Americans who would never trust the stock market, who would never put their money at risk in what they consider the casino of Wall Street. And the Dow Jones Industrials did not exceed its 1929 peak until 1954, a full quarter century later. Um, we can ill afford a similar prolonged period of lack of trust. And major economists all across this country are projecting for this country a long, slow climb out of the damage done by this financial crisis. To the extent that there's a lack of trust in our financial system and mechanisms, that climb will be harder and deeper. So we hope to help people understand what happened. We hope in the end to contribute to restoring faith in our financial system and once again helping shape a financial system that is more about creating jobs and sustained value and enterprise in America than it is about a financial system that operates outside of the economic needs and the mores of this country. So with that, I want to thank you for coming here to meet for asking me to come here today, and I'll take any and all questions. Thank you so much. Um, this organization wanted to comment on this organization's proposal. Um, I, I wish to be here and to lay out the, the structure of this democracy of uh, the past decade here. It's your house. Call on me. Okay. Feel free. My name is Don Bacon, and um, I liked your reference to accountability. And so I'm wondering about uh, civil lawsuits that might be in progress now and perhaps criminal investigations that might be in progress and how your efforts might be impeded by those things as well, ongoing. And also, if at the end of the day, we're looking for accountability, uh, my guess is that people would be reluctant to talk to you because they wouldn't want to be exposed. Could you talk about civil lawsuits, criminal lawsuits, and at the end of the day, what your accountability might look like? Sure. Let me start at the back. So first of all, people not wanting to talk to us, if we want to talk to someone, we'll talk to them because we have the right to subpoena documents as well as witnesses. And we'll 
you know, we, we have a job to do and we intend to do it. And again, I want to say that the, uh, you know, the statute uh, said that uh, the subpoena could be issued by the chair and vice chair jointly or by a majority of the commission with one member of the minority party voting in favor. But the one thing I want to tell all of you is the commission has deliberated on this and we've decided the subpoena power is not to be uh, viewed politically. It's very simple. If we want some documents and we can't get them, we'll subpoena them, period, end of discussion. Same with witnesses. So let me just say that people will not be reluctant to talk to. They may be reluctant, but we have the ability to compel testimony. One other phenomenon that I'll tell you is kind of interesting, again, starting from the back end, is I've been struck by the number of people who do want to talk to us from all walks of life, uh, from leading economists to people who have been on Wall Street, um, who are concerned about the fate of the nation, and many people in the private sector who have been deeply concerned about what happened in our financial markets over the period of the last couple of decades. So I've been struck by the number of people, in a sense, who are in the markets who see that things went terribly awry. So at least at this moment, we're finding that we're getting good cooperation, partly because of national interests and partly because we have the ability to get good cooperation. Um, back to uh, civil and criminal uh, lawsuits. Uh, I don't really see them as interference. I mean, the fact is that um, there's a big playing field out there. Certainly, if there's an ongoing criminal investigation into a specific matter, then it will probably present issues as between the prosecutors and us in terms of obtaining information. But the breadth of what happened here is so large um, that, I, that I doubt currently that any individual criminal investigation will constrain our ability to get to essential truth. Now, there may be times with other bodies who are investigating this work where we may choose to let them, in a sense, uh, bake the facts for us and then take those. One of the things that's in our congressional mandate is that we do, uh, we are supposed to draw on the work of other investigations across this country, and we're already doing that. At our first hearing, we heard excellent testimony from Attorney General Lisa Madigan in uh, Illinois. John Southers, the Attorney General of Colorado, the Chief Counsel of the Miami-Dade uh, Police Office where the level of mortgage fraud has been astounding. So we're actually benefiting from the investigative work that's happened to date. And, and I should say the statute's very clear that with respect to documents from federal agencies, they are compelled to provide us whatever we need, including confidential information, provided, however, we understand that ongoing criminal investigations are a separate matter. Yes. Uh, yes, uh, thank you for coming, uh, Mr. Angelides. Um, my, my name is Van McMurtry. I'm an attorney here with uh, David and Harmon and a long uh, partisan of the NDN. Um, I, I worked for many years in the insurance industry, so I have a question about rating, rating agencies and the work they did and the role that they played uh, in the crisis. Um, it, it always seemed to me that when rating agencies were working with my company, that their capabilities, that this is not meant in a disparaging way, their capabilities were actually quite limited and their tools were quite simple. And I had the intuition that because of innovation in the financial markets, um, instruments are being created that are really no longer susceptible to being rated. It isn't that the rating agencies aren't working hard or that people are trying to conceal things, it's that the instruments themselves and perhaps even some of the organizations themselves um, can't be analyzed anymore. If that's the case, then there seems to be a clash between the cultivation of trust, which is based in a sense on rating, and it's a language that we talk, where we talk to the investors and create trust in them through these numbers. There seems to be a, a tension there between the level of sophistication that we have in our ability to talk trust and what we're actually analyzing. And if that's right, it would seem to me the only way to restore trust would be to insist in some way on a simpler market. Just get your reaction to that idea, uh, what you think. Uh, it, it, think it's that's very valid accurate. point, actually points per NS, because you made a number of them. Uh, let me start at kind of the base level. 
I do agree with having dealt with rating agencies myself as treasurer of the state of California, I did find that um, capacity was limited. Um, and particularly, I believe, as, I've, as we've gotten into this inquiry, I think it's striking the extent to which it was the mismatch between the complexity of the products being moved in the marketplace and the ability of the raters to understand them. Um, and it gave people, a, uh, at best, a sense of false understanding and hope about what was create, included in those securities. What do we have, about a dozen AAA rated corporate entities in this world. And in the course of the last several years, the rating agencies, I believe, have fixed AAA ratings to some 60,000 plus mortgage securities and tranches. Right. Yeah. Well, and here's what I was going to say. I do think this is one of the essential issues, which is what's the price of velocity? or my, some people might say innovation in the marketplace. And someone once gave me a good analogy, which is you can probably design a plane that can fly so fast that humans can't survive in it for any length of time, or you can rely on a 737, which may not be at the height of technological innovation, but gets people from one place to another uh, efficiently and well. And I do think it's gonna be one of the essential questions we have to answer. What's the marginal value of complexity given the risk and damage it it may possibly incur on the economy as a whole, and I think that's a central question. As to the rating agencies themselves, it's striking that in the wake of everything that happened, there's been no significant proposals for reform yet put on the table. Significant, they're at the margins. And uh, I, I, one thing I hope we can do is dig deep, and it's not just the complexity of products, but also what's the appropriate role of a private institution paid by issuers to be relied upon so substantially by investors. I don't think it can continue to persist. Oh, sorry. Yes, uh, you're in charge. Hi, uh, Tim Ransdell with uh, Sempra Energy. Um, just wondering, uh, the proposal uh, last week pushed by the Obama administration uh, to uh, separate banks from uh, holding companies in or from uh, from what they consider riskier uh, approaches. Um, hearing a couple of hearings this week in Senate Banking and the Volcker Rule. Any comments on those approaches and and the extent to which the uh, variety of, of of possible actions by banks could have led to troubles? Um, so the first thing is I'm being very disciplined here. Since we're in our inquiry, I, I have to restrain my normal inclination to express my view about any question that comes my way. Um, but let, let's put it this way. Clearly in our inquiry, we are gonna examine the extent to which um, not just too big to fail in moral hazard was and remains an issue, but also the mixing of high risk practices in the context of a commercial bank was or was not problematic. Well, and as you know, there's a pretty robust debate on that. Jamie Dimon would say, well, look at JP Morgan. We had relatively reasonable leverage ratios. Uh, our overall book of business was diversified enough that we were able to weather the storm. And I will tell you that um, um, very credible people have said to us repeatedly that of all the institutions that face potential meltdown in the fall of 2008, JP Morgan was the one that probably would have won the one that probably would have survived without extraordinary government assistance. So there's some argument that diversity, if you can manage it, may be sustainable. Um, you know, it's an interesting, but having said that, I have a tremendous amount of respect for Mr. Volcker and what he's put on the table. And I'm not sure we fully know, notwithstanding what the banks say, they say that 10 or 20% of their um, profits come from proprietary trading. There are many people who believe that's dramatically understated that they're not counting it at the proprietary trading that accompanies what they're doing with and for clients contemporaneously. But let me just offer one other fact here that I think is important to remember. Glass-Steagall, when it was passed, was not merely to protect the banks and the banking system. It was also passed to protect consumers. People kind of forget that. 
one of the problems that came, or one of the you know findings in a sense of the you know the post meltdown analysis after the 1920s is that policymakers decided that because banks were viewed as steady state respected institutions, it was problematic to allow them to sell risky financial products like Latin American debt to their customers. So part of this, Glass-Steagall, was also protecting the consumer from reckless products offered under the guise of a stable banking system. So I think one of the things that still has to be on the table is how do you best protect consumers? And I will tell you that we're very early in our process here, but uh, you know I've spent 30 plus years of my life in the field of uh, housing, urban development, both in public policy and as a practitioner. As we wade into this inquiry, I am stunned by the extent to which uh, the subprime product really became an infection across our whole marketplace. You know, what used to be viewed as predatory lending products confined to very select low-income uh, neighborhoods, neighborhoods of people of color, became a pervasive national infection. You know, people talk at the end about um, the banks had toxic assets on their banks, on their books, as if somehow those converted from good assets to toxic in the end. I think one of the things we may well find is they were toxic from the day they were originated. And um, you mentioned Glass-Steagall. We need to also think about what happens at origination, what was put into this pipeline. Identify yourself. Uh, you mentioned the availability of subprime um, credit to people who should never have had access to that. Um, in your inquiry, um, are you looking at those individuals who knew that they couldn't make the payment but never expected the value of their home to go down and thought that they would they would refinance in a year or two years, three years? Um, how do you how do you um, access uh, accountability in that context? Do you intend to do that? Yeah, I think we're going to try to look at the whole pipeline. You know, when I talked about taking case studies, scrubbing them head to toe, it is starting at the ground level with loans that were originated and people who took loans. Um, I think we're going to find, though, we're already finding there's some interesting data here, though. A stunning number, and I don't have the exact number here. I don't want to quote it. At age 56, I remember a lot, but not everything. But... I've been struck by the extent to which the subprime lending was not to first-time home buyers, the extent to which it was refinancing. Um, I've been struck by the level of um, fraud that permeated the system. You know, there was a September 2004 report from the FBI. The assistant director went up on the Hill and uh, in September of 2004 said the level of mortgage fraud was reaching such an epidemic level that if it was left, was left unchecked, um, 
that it would result in losses as big as, if not bigger than the SNL crisis. Um, I read that report just the other night, and they looked at you know given pat portfolios of loans, and they saw that the level of fraud, which could be anything from uh, fraud for housing, where people fudge their own numbers so they could get in a house, to outright fraud for profit, uh, was arching above 20%. I talked to some assistant U.S. attorneys across this country who were in the hot spots uh, of the subprime market, and they were finding that fraud levels were going from their normal 1% to 2 to 3% up to 20%. Um, I, and, and so, you know, was there, I mean, do we have to turn a mirror on ourselves, not just people who move these products? Absolutely, but I don't think we can also ignore in the end that these products were, were, had many pernicious aspects which should probably not have been allowed in the marketplace. And one of the things I think is striking is they moved along the pipeline from, from mortgage broker to lender to securitizer all the way along the chain that no one seemed to be wanting to take responsibility for the quality of products they were moving into the chain. If any of you saw my interchange with Mr. Blankfein, I mean, one of the questions I asked him is they, they sold in 2006-2007 about $40 billion worth of mortgage securities to whom he described as highly professional investors. Well, these were pension funds around the country. Um, and at the same time that they sold those mortgage products, they, comp they shorted them, bet against them. Most of those mortgage products went bad within a matter of months. And I think one of the essential questions we're going to have to is, what's the responsibility of people in business and finance uh, with respect to the quality of products they're moving into the marketplace? And um, anyway. Hi, Darrell Hughes with Dow Jones and WSJ. Um, you mentioned having a strong research and investigative staff, so I wanted to know if you could speak to any preliminary findings um, you guys have come up with. Um, second question, um, you mentioned working through Labor Day. After um, the commission finishes the investigative section of the work, after Labor Day, do you guys intend to begin compiling the final report for the president, or do you move to a separate task? All right. So first of all, uh, too early for us to talk publicly about investigative findings. We want to do this in a way where when we move things to the public, uh, they're vetted, they're whole. Uh, we don't want to dribble things out for two reasons. We feel an obligation to uh, have information of real quality moved to the public as well as to make sure that we don't do anything in terms of releasing information that jeopardizes our investigative work. With respect to um, the kind of the post-Labor Day period, uh, our report is due to the President and Congress December 15th. And so, you know, much of our focus post-Labor Day will be to begin to pull together our investigation as well as to do the very hard work of uh, 10 commissioners uh, sitting together and working together and fashioning a report that hopefully um, is unanimous, but as importantly, is powerful in its impact uh, to the American people. I, I think we have a very strong desire to have a nonpartisan, bipartisan, unanimous report, but not doing so in a way that sacrifices what we believe are essential truths. So, so it's, that's going to be a hard piece of work because this is not a process that lends itself to normal political horse trading because the truth is the truth and the facts are the facts. Uh, but Congress did do us an enormous favor in the sense that they didn't call on our report to have a series of policy recommendations which might have you know, uh, gotten people on their ideological haunches right away. They called on us to come to agreement on the facts and the causes of the crisis. And I think that lends itself better to a uh, set of citizens coming to a unanimous conclusion. Uh, to be announced soon. We're gonna, let me just say this. We're going to do a number of types of forums. We're going to do public hearings. But we're also going to have um, opportunities for information to be on the web, as well as we, we anticipate holding some public forums that wouldn't necessarily be in the the uh, formal public hearing process, but for example, hearing from academics and experts who have deep subject knowledge in given areas, uh, we'd like to do some of those and open those to the public, and we will shortly announce our next set of public uh, events.
Rafferty. I'm a regulatory economist and an expert witness for state governments. Uh, but I wanted to follow up on what you just said with a mechanical question. You, you recognize that the new technology lets you put up an enormous amount of primary source documents. Do you see that as happening primarily as backup for the report after it is complete? Or do you intend as, you, uh, as documents are produced to make them available for uh, uh, independent analysis or uh, and public input and uh. a, li a little bit of both and I think again the governing principle is what's in the public interest what's complete and vetted and factual so that we don't uh, take things out of context and and making sure we don't do anything to impede the investigation so I don't think we necessarily view that we're going to hold everything till December 15th before we post it but I think we're going to be very cautious to make sure as we post things that they stand on their own. Uh, you know, for example, to the extent that we might ask for a set of experts um, to provide the commission their view on very specific issues like derivatives, subprime lending, um, shadow banking system. I can see, for example, if we ask for those kinds of uh, pieces of work, and they stand on their own, that we, those are the kinds of pieces that we would place on the web. And of course, after every hearing, we'll be putting on the web all the testimony received. And to the extent that we also have public staff reports, which we envision for most of the hearings going forward, those would also be put on the web. So the answer is yes, we'll do things along the way, as long as it's complete, it's vetted, it doesn't interfere with the investigation. 